Hello, wonderful people. Oh, I can't keep using Anton's opening, can I? I'm going to have to think of my own opening. I have my own closing, which you can see at the end, but I don't have my own opening yet. So I had two requests, or actually a request and a second on that request, to do a video on the Noble Eightfold Path. And this is something I probably wouldn't have chosen to do a video on, but I think maybe there's a good reason and that I can fit it into my book so I can kind of do double duty. But... I already did the Eightfold Path, the Noble Eightfold Path, in my uh, latest book, which uh, all of you should have gotten by now. And it has the dumbest title, the second dumbest title that I've ever put on a chapter, The Noble Eightfold Path. That is one of the dumbest jokes I've ever made, and it wasn't something I expected to make the final cut of the book. But my editor liked it, and then people have said they like it, and I'm like, really? That's the dumbest joke in the world. But that's, o that's okay. If you like dumb jokes, good. You're in the right place. So one thing about the Noble Eightfold Path is that for most people in the Zen tradition, it's generally regarded as part of the older so-called Hinayana material. Hinayana is a derisive term that is kind of not very PC to use anymore. It means lesser vehicle, and it, it refers to the earlier forms of Buddhism, of which only Theravada really exists anymore. And then there's a whole story about Theravada that they actually post-date the Mahayana schools, and they're more of a, an attempt to revive the earlier uh, so-called Hinayana school version of, of Buddhism, but that's a whole other area I don't want to go into. But anyway, that's the only version of the older Buddhism that, that as far as I know, still exists. And, and there were many schools in the past. But anyway, the Zen people tend to regard it as kind of the Hinayana stuff, and they they have a reverence for it. They, they, they like the Eightfold noble, noble Eightfold Path, but you don't find a lot of Zen people lecturing on it, like doing a big, you know, series on the Eightfold Path. Although, when I was going on the internet this morning, I did find a couple of Zen teachers who did that, but they're, they're mostly sort of contemporary, either Japanese teachers living and working in the United States, or uh, American teachers. So, you know, there's that kind of going. You, you find Dogen... Uh, I didn't do like a huge amount of research in this uh, yet, but I will, and maybe over the course I'll find something else. But the only reference I found in Dogen's work to the Eightfold Path is a very fleeting reference where he just mentions it. You know, he doesn't he doesn't go into what it is. He just says, you know, blah blah blah, the Eightfold Path, and and such, as if as if it's sort of taken as a given, and everybody knows what it is, and we don't need to talk about it that much. But here's one thing I found from Shohaku Okumura, who, as uh, regular viewers will know, is a, a Zen teacher, a Japanese Zen teacher who's been living in America for something like 40 years or something. And he's one of the people I admire the most as far as contemporary Zen teachers. He's really the only contemporary Zen teacher whose work I regularly read and pay much attention to. <laughs> I know that's bad of me, but uh, but I think he's really, really good. You know, contemporary living Zen teachers, I mean. Uh, you know, I like Shunryu Suzuki and Kobenchino and Dining Katagiri, but they've all passed away. Uh, Okumura is still alive, Okumura Roshi is still alive, and, uh, and I really like his work, and I, I, I I think everything he does is brilliant. But here's what he said uh, on the Eightfold Path. In his first teaching, Shakyamuni said he had found the middle way. This middle way was the Eightfold Noble Path. Right view, right thinking, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right meditation. That's how Okumura Roshi gives it. That's a pretty standard version. There are other ways to translate those, and maybe we'll talk about them. On the day Buddha entered Nirvana, which means the day he's dying, so, so Okumura Roshi doesn't make a point of this, but the Buddha died of food poisoning, and so he was in pretty bad shape for I don't know how many days before he finally passed away. So you got to imagine this poor guy kind of laying down on, a, on whatever they used for beds in those days, probably with, you know, wrenching pain in his guts and all this stuff. And he is still giving talks. He, he was still entertaining visitors who wanted to talk to him about his, his uh, teachings, and his students were there asking him questions and stuff. So this is the scene that we're setting uh, right there. So on the day Buddha entered Nirvana, the wandering ascetic uh, Subhadda asked, 
There are various religious teachers. They teach different teachings to their students. Have they all gained knowledge through their own wisdom, or have none of them any knowledge, or do some of them have knowledge and others do not? That's the question. The Buddha told Subhadda not to get caught in metaphysical speculation, but to live within the truth. He said, Never mind whether they have all gained knowledge through their own wisdom or not. Where the Eightfold Noble Path is not found, there are no enlightened practitioners. Where the Eightfold Noble Path is found, there are enlightened practitioners. If monks were to live correctly, there would be no lack of enlightened people. And this is Okumura Roshi back again, telling us uh, his opinion on that. He says, Shakyamuni taught how to live the middle way, free of extremes of self-indulgence and self-mortification. Then, to explain the middle way, philosophical systems were established in various lineages of Buddhism. Many people simply studied these philosophies without actually living the Eightfold Noble Path. Such people are like bank tellers who count other people's money. Reading about Zazen is the same, like counting other people's money or studying recipes without cooking or tasting. Even if a medicine has hundreds of benefits, reading about them won't cure us. That gives you a sense of how important the Buddha thought ethics were. So to him, ethics and enlightenment were the same thing. And not everybody taught it that way, and not everybody teaches that it that way. Not only within other schools of spirituality and study and such like, but also within Buddhism. There are people who kind of ignore the ethical stuff and just teach the, the lofty philosophy. Uh, but the, the real Buddhists, as according to Shakyamuni himself, who ought to know because he invented the whole thing, are the ones who are concerned with ethical behavior. So that's, that's how important it is. So there's this idea of a, an experience called enlightenment or Kensho or Satori. And people imagine that this experience will give them a, a true understanding of reality. And yeah, I, I think in, in a lot of cases it does. But what the Buddha was interested in was not only that. He was definitely interested in that. I mean, you can tell that for sure. And he taught about it and he lived it. But he was also interested in setting up a, a system of ethics for people to follow and thereby, I think, hopefully creating a better world. And one of the reasons for wanting to create a better world is that in a world where more people are ethical, where they don't step on each other's toes or start wars with each other or steal each other's stuff or misuse each other sexually and all the other things that we talked about in the Ten Precepts, in a world where those things happen less, then more people can concentrate on understanding the true nature of reality. If more people concentrate on understanding the true nature of reality, then humanity evolves and becomes a better thing. And I think that is what the Buddha really was interested in. He wasn't just interested in a kind of personal salvation for himself. He was interested in a kind of creating a better world for everybody and for future generations who would go on beyond him. And, and this is where we are now. There is, uh, there is a lot of stuff going on in the world. There's bad stuff going on in the world all the time. Nobody can ever argue that point. But if you look at it, uh, Steven Pinker wrote this book called The Better Angels of Our Nature, which I haven't read, but I've read excerpts of it in the abstract. So I'm not criticizing the book. I'm just telling you what's in there. Uh, he, he actually researched uh, the incidences of crime and, and war and you know other such bad things and found that even though we are much more aware of wars and crimes and so on and so forth that go on these days because the news media is very thorough and, and, and makes us aware of every single one, the actual incidences of those things happening have, have gone down over time. Uh, even if you factor in World War II, that's the amazing thing. That 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 uh, that was the little statistic that somebody pulled out in the excerpt that I read of the book. Was that even if you factor in all the violence and horribleness and death of World War II, it still shows a downward curve of violence from you know whenever he started measuring it and however he started measuring it to today. And I think. I won't say Buddhism is the only reason for that. Buddhism is one of the reasons, you know, the kind of 
wider understanding of ethical behavior. And because we can understand ethical behavior better as a species, we don't get in each other's way as much, and more of us can practice. Now, that doesn't mean everybody can practice, and it doesn't mean everybody's got a great life. So don't write in comments and send me emails saying that I'm saying that, because I'm certainly not. But, but as more people get a better life, then more people can have a better life as we as we kind of expand it outwards it kind of grows you know exponentially uh, and that is how we save the world rather than just saving ourselves and uh, you know having our own kind of experience as you'll remember if you've heard me talk about this before the the traditional story of buddha's enlightenment is that he sat there under the bodhi tree and he had this experience of profound awakening and his first thought was I'll keep this to myself because nobody's gonna understand this there's no way anybody's gonna get this and the legend has it that the god Indra who's sort of a, a figure similar to Zeus uh, comes down from wherever he lives and says no Buddha you gotta teach the people about this you gotta, you gotta teach the people that's my <laughs> bad Bill Cosby imitation so um, but he, um, he listened to Indra and said, yeah, I'm going to teach the people, and thus Buddhism was born. Buddhism was not just Buddha's personal en enlightenment experience, it was his effort to try to make that available to others, and part of his effort to make it available to others was to teach a, a very strict ethical path. So there you go, and I'm going to see what I can do with each of the eightfolds of the Noble Eightfold Path, and maybe we'll turn this into a series. I don't know if I'll do it exactly like I did the last one, but we'll see. I'll try uh, to keep um, you know, steady with it and, and, uh, and get through all eight of them. At least there's eight instead of ten. So thank you, and if you want to support me putting up the rest of these videos for you, please send a donation to the address you're seeing on your screen, or if you're watching on YouTube, you can actually click on direct links in the description of the video to my PayPal and Patreon pages. That is how I make my living. That's how I make all this stuff happen and how I make these videos for you. If you are having financial trouble, don't donate. <laughs> Just don't. Uh, things are not that bad for me, but I do thank those of you who continue to contribute because that's, uh, that's how I buy, you know, uh, Ziggy food and things like that. So I thank you very much. Have a good time all the time. See you later.